All right. Good morning, everybody. I'll wait, give it a minute to see if it decides to update and actually stream. It says it's streaming. So hopefully you'll be able to see it. Ah, there we go. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. So this is our design shop talk. My name is Samantha Mirabal. I'm with the applications team and we are doing these on a weekly basis. So be sure to ask your questions. All right. So this week we only had a few questions that were um, sent in ahead of time. So I was going to go over those, but please feel free to, um, good morning, to type in other questions that you might have. All right. So just to start off, um, how to add hoops. This is kind of an overall, just so I don't forget to go over something. Um, we've got how to add specific hoops. Um, hi there, everyone at Milko. And oh, Brian, Margaret, Margaret, Edith. All right. So these are the questions I got ahead of time. Um, hopefully you can see them. We have uh, how to add hoops within Design Shop, I assume. Um, this one, I didn't actually try that one. It was from last week. I forgot about that. I was looking at all these others. Um, the small column settings, we'll need to go over that. And my computer is doing something weird. Well, I'm going to assume it's working. Because it says it's streaming. All right. Hmm. So for let's start with the small column settings. Hi there. All right. So here we have what the small column settings are. For first off, what is that referring to? That's talking about pull compensation. So if I have, I don't know, whatever, text. All right. Hi there. And let's do something that's actually small. So let's change it to a thin font of sorts. All right. So there are actually some thin areas. All right. So let's say that's what we've got. I'm going to turn this off, center it, and make it where we can actually see what's going on. So pull compensation is what's going to account for the fact that embroidery shrinks as it goes along. So when, as it's sewing from side to side, it's going to, you know, going across these columns, these stitches are going to try to move in. Those are going to try to move over. So we need to compensate for that using pull compensation. Now, pull compensation you have over here as the pull comp tab, you can do it by percent. Okay. That's multiplication based. So that's going to look at the length of the stitch and whatever percent you give it, it's going to over stitch. So instead of sewing here, it might be 10% bigger. Um, so it's going to overstitch or under by whatever percentage you give. So that might be okay for um, medium sized things or for constant width columns. But what you'll notice when you're using pull comp by percent is it induces distortions into designs. Um, the easiest way to show it would be to, um, if I take a square or something like that and then change my stitch direction, all right, so I'm going to put it on an angle there. So now I'm going to take that and add some pull comp. Now let's make it really ridiculously large. Let's say 150. All right. What you'll see is my square no longer looks like a square because what it does is it looks at the length from here to here, which is small, and a, a multiplication, a small percent of a small distance is going to basically overstitch it just a little bit. Whereas when it's, by the time it gets down here, it's a long distance from one side to the other. So it's going to compensate and add additional length to your sewing much more on these areas. So you can actually start introducing distortions. So that's just, that's by compensation by percent. Now you can also do it by offset. So what offset's going to do is it's just, you tell it how much larger to make the column. That's it. So if it's going to sit here, you tell it, all right, well, instead of sewing along there, overstitch it by one point or by two points, three points, whatever you want. And it just makes it bolder. So you've, if you had noticed as I was clicking, these tiny little areas went wider, okay, and, rather, and the others got bolder. So it just pull offset makes everything bolder. So what about this down here where it says enable small column pull comp scale? All right. So what this does is for your small areas, it's an additional pull compensation. All right. So whatever you do up here, it's going to that 
that effect is going to happen. But whenever a column gets smaller than what you have here, it's going to apply a different, an additional 10% in this case on top of whatever was there. It'll add 10% additional distance. Um, I'll be honest, I don't use this a whole lot um, because 10% of a small number is still a really small number. So it doesn't do a whole lot. And what you'll actually notice is you can start you can actually see it here. Um, you see there's an angle on that because the small things here add additional percentage, so it's actually adding additional distortion where your small stitches can get larger than the other ones, so it adds these steps and other things. So what this small compensation really is doing is saying when things get small, add additional pull compensation. Okay, um, But it's only by percent. There is no offset option, so because of that, I don't use it hardly ever. I just stick with offset and call it done because I don't like the additional distortions that get added to things when you go into this type of mode, okay, where you're adding, you know, doing it by percent, okay? So those are your small comp settings, okay, column settings. Hi there, Gary. So, um, Rachel, I hope that helps. Um, let's see, how do we adjust the, the width of a satin column border on an applique? Okay, that's fun. So when you're doing applique work, you can do it a whole bunch of different ways. I know there's a bunch of videos on our Facebook Live. Um, <laughs> hey, Kelly. Kelly, for the Claudia Donnell, design, Donnell designs, did you look at um, Mate, Nate's video that he did on Wednesday with the um, continuous hooping? Did you get a chance to look at that? because he actually did a alignment um, design there. Anyway, all right, so let's quick look at applique. Sorry. So, I don't know, I'm just going to draw a basic shape, just because it's quick. Applique, there's a bunch of videos on it that we've done, um, various folks have put up there, and what you'll notice on there, you'll have um, applique, you know, whatever shape you're doing, you're going to put fabric down to replace stitches, okay? So rather than doing an entire area with fill, you would put fabric in its place. So typically how you would do that is you would have some sort of placement stitch that tells you where your fabric's going to go, okay? So this is if you're going to digitize it by hand, right? So you would have a placement stitch. I would usually just control C, control V. So it copies it, give it a different color because that way I can program an applique stop in. Then I have my second. That's actually where I go lay down my fabric and then it's going to sew this color down. From there, I usually copy and paste it again, give it another color, but this time we need to convert that over into a tack down stitch, so a tackle stitch. So you can do that by either going to operations, change element type, or I usually just select it, hold the control key, control changes the element type, and then click on the single line center. And that'll switch it over to a single line center, so then I can tell it to be a tackle. All right. So, so far we've got a placement. We've got to hold the fabric down, so now we can stop the machine and cut it. We've got a tackle. Now, a 20-point tackle is pretty narrow. If you've ever done any applique, um, that's not really going to hold down those edges really nicely. So, I prefer that to be larger, somewhere closer to 30. So, right here where the width is, notice that changes your tackle, your zigzag. All right. So, Specifically, Rachel, you're asking how do you change that width? You can do it up here, but that's in the single line settings right here. All right, so where the width is 30, so that's just the tackle. So that's just the tack down stitch, what's holding the edges of the fabric, so that whatever decoration you're going to do, the fabric's not moving around. Well, then your last step to applique is usually some sort of satin stitch over it. So again, I can copy and paste this one, give it another color. And then this time, instead of tackle, we want it to be a satin stitch. All right. Now from here, you want it larger than the zigzag usually. So if you want it four millimeters, you'd put it up at 40 points. And now you've got a nice wide, wide satin stitch over there. So now it really just boils down to how much do you want on the fabric and how much do you want off. Right now it's set at a 50-50 split. Okay, that's just what I have here. Um, you can go into the properties and under your single line, Notice that's what this is. A single line center is you draw a center line and then tell it how wide it's going to make every stitch. So from one edge to the other, how wide is that stitching? And it's going to split it evenly. So this is 40 points, 20 points is on the top, 20 points is on the bottom. 
All right. Well, you can also tell it to be custom. So this is pretty fun when you're trying to skew it more onto the fabric or more off the fabric in some cases. You can put them like this. And notice you're going to have to do it with the, with the tackle as well. But if I put this at a 60-40, all right, that means 60% of that stitch length is going to be on the fabric and 40% is going to be up here. So 40, 60. And you can make it whatever way you want to skew it. Okay, now whatever you do to this, you're going to want to do to the tackle stitch as well because otherwise you'll end up with it hanging out like this, which isn't a very pretty look. Okay, so um, now this is what I did here is all just creating appliques manually. All right. Um, now, if you want to do it using the applique tool within Melco, so I'm just going to again go to right click operations, change element type, and go to applique. So I'm going to take that walk stitch that I first created and I'm going to add an applique. All right, so let me turn all these others off just to make it go away. So now I have three colors. If I go into the properties of this, now I can see them. What it what it is. So I've got a walk, that's my placement stitch. Okay, it's got 30 points from, and that's the stitch length, so how far apart needle penetrations are as it runs in a circle. And no problem, Rachel. All right, so that's your placement and your stitch line. So for your tack down, again, that's the density that I set manually as a tackle in 17. And then this is the top stitching, which is the satin stitch over it. Now, if you want to adjust this to be more on the fabric or more off the fabric, that's done under this applique tool right here. Right here, you'll see it has inside, outside. So if I change this to, let's say, 50-50 for both of these, notice now my placement the running stitch that does first is right down the middle now, and then half of the width is here, half the width is there. Now, how wide are those things? Well, this is the column width. So if you want the column wider, let's say you want it 46 points, 4.6 millimeters in that range, you can make it larger. If that tackle stitch, if you like it closer to 30, you can reduce that down to 30. It really comes down to personal preferences on how you want to do those, um, how wide you want those. You know, I tend to like somewhere between 27 and 30 for my tack down and anywhere from 40 to 45, 46, somewhere in there for my cover stitch. I just think it looks pretty. It's, there's some people like smaller, some like bigger. It's really a personal preference. So um, that just looks pretty to me. All right. So that's when you're using the applique tool, how you adjust that. And again, if you're going to just adjust it manually, so rather than using it as applique, you can go into the properties. Under the single line, change your width. You know, 40 is a four millimeter. You can tell it to be center, which splits it half the width on one side, half the width on the other. You can do a left or right, justify it up completely on or off. Or that's my favorite right there, is using the custom because you can control how it goes all the way around there. Okay. So that would be the applique. So what else do we have? All right, so that's how we adjust the width of the column of those borders. All right, there was also a question on how do we mimic hand embroidery? That's kind of a loaded question. Some of it you can do, some of it you can't. So this down here is a chain stitch. These are what, I think that's called a purl stitch. I don't remember what that one's called, but these two stitches here, this pink one and the yellow one, the thread is actually floating above the fabric. So it's like you can wind the thread around a needle and then you'd stab through so it actually leaves like a puff of thread above the fabric. You can't do that sort of thing with um, our machines. Now the chain stitch here is you can do. So we can get pretty close to that. It is not actually the same type of stitch because those are done by making a loop, pulling the needle up through the middle. And so you end up with these loops that are interconnected, right? Well, our machines don't do that. But what you can do is use a custom decorative stitch and kind of just plan out like a slight V. So as it overlaps and goes between them, it ends up looking like the chain stitch, okay? So you can get pretty close to this one these, there's no way to actually make the thread float like that, that I can think of. The only thing I could think for maybe this one would be to, um, you know, do a satin stitch using maybe a bermolana in a circle pattern. 
and it would look like that, but it's a completely different type of stitch. You know, it's not going to move on top of the fabric. Okay, so it's it is different, um, but so the anyway, these are done with decoratives. All right, so I'll pull up decoratives in a sec before I forget because I'm all the way down here. Let's go back to the how do we add hoops? Okay, so to add hoops. I usually do it from Design Shop. Um, now, I did know there was a question earlier, maybe last week, I don't remember. It was in one of the forums where someone said, hey, I added a hoop, and when I go to over into OS, you know, I added the hoop in Design Shop, but when I go to OS, it's not there. Um, why is that? Well, it really depends on how old and how your in software is all installed. There is a common hoop database that can be used, and but if you're softwares are not set up so that your hoop, the one you updated, is in that common folder, then you actually have to put your hoop file under both of the softwares. So if you go find that hoop, and um, I forget the act, what comes out, MDB, uh, I don't know. Anyway, the hoop file, it's hoop dot something, m something. <laughs> I can look it up for you in a minute. But you'll take that file, whichever one you updated it, you can copy it and paste it over into the OS one to overwrite that and then it should show up in both of them but assuming you're using the common one where it's the common files one hoop file shared by both softwares you would come over here and say tools hoop setup and then let's see right here you would say add hoop type in okay I shouldn't do that um, hoop test all right you would create that and then you have to know the hoop shape all right so you can tell it ex exact sizes give it the number of points and you can actually program through here like if it's a custom shape all right you can tell it if there's offset if you've got you know 15 points if you have 15 points set to find there you go <laughs> hoop mdb is the file name thank you <laughs> um Right here, it, you would actually go around for whatever hoop shape that you have and define your X and Y position of each of the points that create it. All right. So um, I don't know if it's Nate or Scott or Mike or whoever's helping today. <laughs> There's a, They posted a link in the comments so you can see the install instructions of how to get the hoop MDB file updated. But if you create your own hoops, you have to know the geometry of the hoop. So from there, you can actually type in in points your um, all your dimensions, right? So for each point, what your dimensions are of the each location is going to be, and they give you some t things down here of what the coordinates are, how the axis needs to be centered and whatnot, and you literally just type them all in. When it's done, you'll now have that hoop. Okay, hi Nate and Scott. <laughs> all right, so. That's how you would create a new hoop. All right, you'd type in the size, what type of hoop it is, give it the different points, and then it should show up in both softwares. Okay. Now, like I said, if it's not showing up in OS, but it is in Design Shop or vice versa, you'd either go recreate it in the other software, or better yet, just um, hey Brian, yeah, or just take the um, hoop file and paste it in the other one. Okay. Let's see, what other questions? All right, so that was how to create specific hoops, right? You go add hoop and just type in the geometry of the hoop. Um, how to digitize 430 weight gunold polystar thread. Okay, how do we digitize for 30 weight gunner polystar, polystar thread? Well, I don't know that thread. 30 weight thread is kind of like metallic. Um, metallic threads tend to be, you know, a, a little bit thicker. So you would, you know, kind of follow the same rules. I know Madeira actually has some guidelines when you look up the threads. And I don't know if Gunnell does the same thing, but they actually show recommended densities. It's usually in millimeters. Um, they'll actually give it like a 4.0 or whatever densities they say. So for depending on how you have your um, your software set up, you would need to convert it over to points, um, possibly. Okay. Let's see. Under associated machines, I have EMT16 and XTS. I only have the XTS. How do I remove the EMT16? 
Are you talking that question? Okay, so for Judy Hart, how did, I'm not quite sure where that, where you're talking about. If you're talking about in OS, where there's under tool, uh, where is that? Um, tools, serial numbers, and then there's a list of machines that are there. So there's a bot where you can actually select, and select a machine and hit remove. So I'm not sure if that's where you're talking about. Um, you might, if you can clarify, maybe I can help you a little bit better there. Oh, in the hoop manager? Oh, no, you, you don't remove anything there. Okay, so if I go to tools, hoop setup, here, you would just pick whatever machine you want. I mean, all of these, there's none that, um, they're just here, so it does, really doesn't matter. I don't think you can actually remove any of them. Okay. All right, let's see. What else was there that I just missed? Is there a way in Design Shop to have Design Shop change settings based on the thread type you pick under the thread color? Hmm, that's a good question. You might have actually stumped me this time. I think, um, I wonder if you can do it with styles. Maybe. Edit. Yeah, so you could probably use styles, create a new style, set the properties you want, and then apply that style. You know, let's say you had a specific setting for metallic or for, you know, settings you like for underlay and all that. You can create a style that would give it a name of what you would remember. And then over here, when you go to use it, you would select whatever element it is. You would say, you know, what style you want, and then rather to project, you would say selection apply, and then you can apply whatever um, style it is to that particular element. So that would be one way to do it. I'm not sure it's the best, but that's one way you could. Um, I don't know, though, if you can tie that to the actual thread. I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't, I want to say no, but I don't know for sure, so I'll have to get back to you. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, so I'd have to look at, I'd, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I'm not at hundred percent sure. Okay. Well, let's see. There were some other ones. If I can get back to them. Hmm. I can't see the other ones. So I'm trying to remember what there were. Oh, so how do we mimic the hand embroidery? So you've just used decorative stitches. So, um, you would go and create whatever shape it is. Okay, so Nate and Scott say styles would be the only way, so yeah. Whatever, you would create whatever stitch you want to turn into your um, decorative and then save it off. So just, I always do this because it's easy to see, but it's rather ugly. So if I draw something ugly and you want to turn that into a decorative, you would select it. You need to make sure your starts and stops are on the same point, on the same line. And then I can come over to save custom shape. And I got to that by selecting the element, right click and say, save custom shape. I can tell it to be a decorative, give it a name. I usually, as I'm creating these, keep on overriding the same one until I like it. And once I like it, then I save it off as the actual name. So that's why I'll save it as test file already exists, replace it. Yes. So then I can test it by creating a decorative, changing it to test draw my thing and see how it looks. So I didn't actually make the points on the same line and you can tell that because there's that weird step. So when you're creating your, um, trying to recreate that chain stitch, you would literally just program out whatever shape it is you want and as it draws and overlaps, make sure your starts and stops are in a little bit, then it will pattern itself over and it would kind of give you the same effect as a chain stitch. Like I said, I can't really think of short of getting the a way to get the exact same stitches that you would on these over here these two right here because that the thread is actually on top of it um, on top of the fabric and it can move around which you can't do that sort of thing with embroidery machines okay uh, when you do a column and hold shift and enter it makes weird col 
a weird shape column. Why does it do that? I know shift enter automatically for most shapes. Like if I do it on um, walk, right? So if I just draw a shape and I stop here, okay? So my start is way over here. My stop is right here. If I hold shift and hit enter, it automatically closes the shape. All right, let me get rid of the decorative so you can see that. Okay, so it automatically connected my start and stop. All right, so I'm wondering if on column it does weird things because when I do shift enter, because it's connecting back to the start point. Yeah, that's exactly what it's doing. So shift enter, I didn't realize column that worked that way too. So when you hold shift and enter, wherever you end it, it's going to add two more points to connect your where you stopped to where you started. Hey, that's cool. I said I didn't realize I'd you know, do that. So, all right, so that's with columns. Um, were there any other questions that I missed? Yeah, so shift enter when you're doing um, the walks or your single line centers, if you want to connect, have a shape close, I mean, you know, back to the start point, shift enter will automatically do that. So you don't have to click close to that and have to deal with making sure your points overlap. Okay. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So what other questions do we have? Any? You know what? I've got a really ugly mess on the screen there. That's better. <laughs> um, Kelly, you had asked about the Claudia Danelle designs. Watch let's if you can do me a favor if you haven't watched Nate's um, video that he did on Wednesday watch that and then type in if that doesn't help all right and we'll we can work on it after that does that sound all right okay so what other questions anything else I'm out of things to talk about unless you guys have things mm -hmm. I don't see any others popping up all right, so remember, um, it's we're doing this on a weekly basis, so make sure you sending your questions. I tend to post on Wednesday or Wednesday-ish just trying to solicit questions so I have something to talk about. I'm just staring at the computer. Um, but you can send emails over, oh, go over auto merge. Auto merge. Okay. Not sure. What do you mean auto merge? I usually just merge things by selecting the elements. So whatever they they are. So let's say I have two things selected, and I want to merge them together. Oh, you're talking about color auto merge. Yes. All right. So if I've got different colors here and I add additional things right so let's say I'm digitizing and I've got different shapes you know just different elements it can be text it can be multiple things if I have them like this right where I've got two elements that are the same color well how do you get them together well right here there's a auto merge color blocks oh whoops there you go all right let's try that again instead of looking at me <laughs> all right so let's say we have multiple things and you can see over in my project view I have three elements drawn on the screen but I'm really only using two colors right okay so now that we see we have these two colors to make them merge together there's several ways to do it where I can come over here and click on this and it will merge that one into theirs. So now I have a single color, all right? But right here you have auto merge. So what auto merge will do is every time you have the same color back to back, it will automatically combine them. So if I've got that one highlighted, you'll see right here, if I move this one back up, notice it automatically combines that, all right? So I didn't have to do anything all right, so it actually merges those together into one color so that you don't have to program two separate color changes or manually put it together. The Be careful with this. It is automatic. It Once that's on, if something is here it, and it's the same color, it will put it together. 
right? So if I change this one over to that same color, now this is a single color design, all right? Um, and it's not something that, well, it looks like it did undo this time, but just you've got to be careful with that because it will auto merge it. Now, if you're looking at designs um, like applique designs, a lot of times you have the same color thing stitching multiple times and you don't actually want it to be one color change. You need the separate color changes so that you can um, program those stops when you go to the machine. So just be careful about that, that you actually want things to combine when you use this. I usually leave it off just because I tend to do a lot of applique stuff myself. Let's see. Show people how to remove object groups and what you can do while it's on. How to remove object groups. What do you mean by object groups? Having a moment here. Um, if you're referring to how do we remove overlap. So like I've got these two shapes that are overlapped and I don't want to have the those stitches under there. Is that what you mean? Sorry. So that's subtracting elements. So if I take this bottom one, the, what I want to remove the stitches from, select that first. I hold the control key down, select what I want to subtract from it. Then up here, I've got my combined object between inset and the graphics. Oh, ungroup, group, ungroup. Okay, that's easy. All right. All right, well, since I started it, let me quick show it. Select one, select the other, subtract the elements, and now you'll see they're separate pieces and it removed the overlap stitches. Okay, so that's subtracting. All right. Um, when you're grouping things and ungrouping them, so there's a bunch of reasons you might want to actually group things. Here's one example. Let's say I've got a shape that has a border on it, right? The circle has a border. Let me delete these other things or move them out of the way anyway. Okay. So let's say I have a shape with a border and I don't ever want to do this, right? I don't ever want to separate them so that my border is no longer registered, right? So what you can do is group those together. So to group them, you select it, both of the elements, you can select both of them a few different ways. S hold the control key down, select one here, select the other, and then you're, you have group right here. Notice it gives them both a number two next to it. And now, no matter what I do with them, they move and scale, everything happens as a unit, all right? There's no way to actually separate those without ungrouping it. So, all right, well now I need to actually separate them for whatever reason. I don't want that, um, fill, I want the fill to be a different color. Maybe that's what you want. Well, up here you have ungroup element. So now they're separate, okay? So now I can come over here and make the border a different color. I can move it somewhere else. I can, you can, you have more options of what you can do with it because now they're not moving and selecting as a unit, okay? So it's, I'll group things all the time, um, mainly just so as my mouse is a little flaky here. It's kind of broken, and it tends to double-click on all kinds of things. So uh, I'll do that just to avoid dragging things around by accident. Okay. Let's see. What other questions do we have? Any others? So we talked about the auto merge, turning it on and off. Is that it really just what use case, whether you want to use that or not? Okay. What others? I don't see any others typed in. Anyone else before I call it a day and we'll pop? So. If you have questions, you can send them to applications at mocha.com, and that somebody from the application team will get it, hopefully get back to you. If not, we can add it to any questions to these on a weekly basis. Um, you can type them in on the various things when we post that we're going to have these, type in your questions. We'll try to review those. Um, if you have questions that we didn't go over here, be sure to type them in. We can add them to next week's, or if it's easy, we'll just type a response to you. So I hope these are helpful for you. Um, like I said, it's, we want you to be successful with all this. So let us know what questions you have and we'll be, we'll get to it and find a way to help you. All right. If there's no other questions, I'm going to hop off for the day and talk to you guys next week.
All right. Well, thanks. I'm glad. Oh, let's see. Can you help with how to print names on the back of a cap? Okay. So names on the back of the cap. What are you actually struggling with? The alignment of it or the arch or um, how to hoop it or what? Because that... There's a bunch of different things, a bunch of different things of what you might have issues with, right? So um, hooping it, you can do it with a round hoop on the edge of a table, and I think there's some videos on that. I'll look for the links and put them up there um, so that you can have, you can see different hooping techniques for back a cap. So I'll actually post those in the comments below so that you can see that. Um, because you can use a round cap. There's actually a frame um, that's called back of cap frame that works really well. A lot of people like that for hooping the back of the cap. I tend to just use a round. Um, it's easy. The arch really depends on the hat and it just takes a little bit of practice. Generally, I tend to take a picture after I hoop it. I take a picture straight on it or scan it and then um, use that, bring in the picture in a design shop and draw an arch around it. So that's how I've gotten into doing it, because that way it's a straight on picture, especially if you scan it and you can go ahead and, you know, make the art, the name follow the, follow the shape of the hat, essentially. Um, oh yeah, Sue did a video for back a cap. So I'll find, we'll find some resources and put them out. Um, I'll give you some links because I'm not set up here to actually show you hooping techniques, but we'll get that for you. All right. Hopefully these are helpful, and like I said, be sure to type in your questions and we'll get to them. All right, I will talk to you guys next time. All right.